because we're thirsty, Lord, and we hunger for you, God. And we just thank you, Lord, that we have a, a place where we can meet together, God, and just fellowship, Lord, and glorify your name together, God. What a beautiful picture it is, Lord. When your people gather, Lord, and praise you for all that you've done, God. We just want to lift your name up, Lord, tonight. And I pray that you just be stirring within us, God, that you'd be moving, Lord. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Will your grace and me 
Your word is a lamp onto my feet. Jesus, I love you. I love you. Your name is like honey on my lips. Your spirit like water to my soul. Your word is a lamp to my feet. Jesus, I love you. I love you. Spirit 
Well, good evening, everyone. Evening. Welcome tonight. It's been a, a long journey going through Leviticus, <laughs> and we're going to end it tonight Woo-hoo. in chapter 27. So before we do that, though, and I know you're all anticipating that ending, <laughs> Leviticus was very difficult book to go through as it always is but there was just so much that was there and I learned 
so much more. So I just appreciate the book that much more. But before we get into the word, let's grab your bulletins. If you don't have one, raise your hand and they'll get you one. And let's just go through a couple of events that are happening uh, tomorrow. We have our discipleship class at 6.30. So those of you that are a part of the discipleship class, uh, remember at 6.30 we'll be meeting. We will not be having a Easter meeting. So that will be the following week. So let everyone else know so that you don't show up. Well, if you show up, then you're there with the discipleship class. You can stick around and <laughs> fellowship with us. So. So I just want to make that clear. Uh, let's see, April 5th is the youth night here at the church. And um, things are going really good with the youth. Night of Champions is this coming weekend. So if you, uh, I'm sure you can probably buy tickets. No? I'm waiting. Can you buy them at the door? That's Okay, so you may be able to buy tickets at the door for Night of Champions. So you can see Carlos or just look up Night of Champions on Google and I'm sure they'll... They'll let you know. The cost is $20 at this point, and um, you can uh, register there probably online, and it's in Glendora and Azusa Pacific University. So, all right, let's have the ushers come forward. Usher. <laughs> all right, let's uh, pray. Gracious Father, we, we just thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to just give back to you, Father. Bless your people, Lord. Father, you have truly blessed us with life itself, the breath that we take every day for granted, Father, a heart that just beats without thinking about it, and your grace, Lord, that just pours upon us, Lord, with beautiful family, friends, a church, Lord, a job. Father, uh, you provide in so many wonderful ways, Lord, and we thank you for that, Father. And now we give back to you, Lord. A little bit of what you have given us, Father. And may you just give the church wisdom, Lord, as they use this, Father, that it may stretch and be used for your glory, to beautify your place, to reach uh, the homeless, Father, to reach the community. Lord, uh, just provide for your temple here, Lord, as we're living on this earth, Father. And Lord, we pray that you administer to us through the message, through the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, while they are collecting, grab your Bibles, your highlighters, and your pins. That was one thing that I always had on my Bible with me or in my little briefcase. I love Virginia's uh, little case for her Bible. It's an American flag. Mm -hmm. And she's got pouches in there that she keeps uh, all kinds of information and pins and papers. And you'll look at her Bible and it's written all over. Uh, mine is written all over and used. I probably should get back to using it more. But with technology today, it seems like I use my Bible a lot less. Uh, shame on me, I guess. I'm just confessing that now. So, so turn it to Leviticus chapter 27. If you have a Bible, open it up. If you have a... A device, smartphone, then turn your <clears throat> smartphone to that chapter. And tonight's theme is the value of a man. The value of a man. Now, some, some men are worth more than others, you might believe. The value of a man on, on this earth, at least, uh, in, in various ways, might be worth more than others, just depending on your perspective. If you have a great electrician, he would be worth a lot more than a bad electrician. You know, if you have a good neighbor, he'd be worth a lot more than the bad neighbor and so forth. But when it comes to the eyes of God, humans are loved by God and he values them tremendously, whether good or evil. God loves the world. In fact, Luke tells us in chapter 12, 27, he uh, Jesus said, consider the lilies of the field. And you know here in Lake Elsinore, there are poppies up there, and it is really beautiful over there. I took a picture on my way home from a meeting, and it's just hills and hills of poppies. And because of that, people are uh, congregating over there and worshiping nature. 
I heard that uh, there were so many people that they um, likened it to being at Disneyland. That's how many cars were there and how many people were on the hills in that area. But he said, consider the lilies. Consider those lilies and how they grow. They neither toil or spin. And yet I say to you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if you uh, read anything about Solomon, he was pretty wealthy. And he can afford the nicest threads that were out there. And yet Solomon's clothing, his array, his glory was nothing like the glory of these lilies that God clothed. He says, if then God has so clothed the grass, which today is in the field and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? I mean, God provides for us. He is faithful to take care of his children. If he can create a beauty like that, then he can make sure that we have enough to survive on this earth. That's how valuable you are to God. Now, in this chapter, we find God's rules concerning the validation of a consecrated person and also his property. Now, the validation is a certain amount, what they're worth in receive in redeeming them. So if you consecrate something, that is you set it apart for God's service, whether it's a person, someone in your family, a child, or whether it's property, there's a value that's assigned to it depending on its worth. And you can redeem that item. And so he's dealing with this at the very end. Now Leviticus, as I said, has been a really, really good journey for me. It has caused me to first realize that God does give us warnings, and those warnings are very clear. He tells us about the future and what the future has for us in our daily walk next year, uh, what's going to happen in 10 years from now. Uh, he's very clear, prophetically, by his word. He warns us just as though he warned the children of Israel before they were even entering into the promised land. This is what you will encounter. This is what will attack you. This is what will destroy you. And so you need to be on guard. And so God is relaying this message through Moses to the children of Israel. Uh, another thing that the Lord has shown me through this is that God calls those in the church to be leaders and to take God's text simply, his word, and preach it, explain it, expound on it and give the application to the people so that they understand how they ought to live before God. Because your future is tomorrow. And if you apply these things today, then your future tomorrow will be bright. But we must apply the scriptures to our daily living. So three points tonight. First point will be validation of a man. Second point, validation of property, whether it's animal or a home or material things. And then He closes with tithes, will be our third point in a couple of verses there, probably reminding the children of Israel to take care of the temple uh, once they get into the promised land, which will be built. So let's look at the validation of a man. And by the way, if you're a person that feels that you're not valued, please be assured that God values you. Don't let the enemy rob you. Don't let the enemy lie to you. And make you feel as though you're less than someone else because you're not. Jesus Christ died on the cross for all of us. All of us are worth something. The Bible says we're the apple of his eye. We're his affection. The whole purpose and reason that he came was to die for us so that we could have eternal life. So your value is very important to him. Don't let the enemy and his children lie to you. You're very valuable, and there's a work that God wants to do to you. So the value of a man, the validation of a man. Look at verse 1. Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and say to them, When a man consecrates by a vow certain persons to the Lord, according to your validation. So certain persons, so there's a variety of men that you can Uh, consecrate to the Lord. Make a vow to God that I'm going to set this person aside for you. Remember the story of Hannah. And if uh, Hannah got pregnant, she said, I will set this child, consecrate it to you. And she did that. And that child was Samuel. 
he became a prophet of the Lord. So whatever, by whatever value, consecrate a person of the Lord according to your validation. Uh, so the words you are reading in Leviticus 27 uh, are the actual words of the Lord himself regarding uh, this consecration. Uh, we forget that sometimes, that the Bible is really God's word, and it's though he's speaking to us. We should always consider the Bible as though God is speaking to us personally. Yes, he wrote the Bible through men, but they were his words. And this is a great example of it. It says the Lord spoke to Moses, and then Moses wrote this down in some early language uh, at this time, uh, which um, is probably more than likely a Hebrew language at this time. Moses begins to write uh, Genesis, the Pentateuch, all the way to uh, Deuteronomy. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. Numbers, <clears throat> Deuteronomy. And so the Lord spoke to him. The Lord spoke to Peter. The Lord spoke to Paul. The Lord spoke to these guys to write these things down for us. So this is the word of God. It, it has been tried and tested and true. Uh, there, are no, there are no errors in it whatsoever. So it would behoove all of us to really, in a sense, you know, take our shoes off and listen to God because we're like on holy ground every time we open up this word. This is God speaking to us and he's speaking to the children of Israel. Now, what did it mean to consecrate a person to the Lord? Uh, it could be done either for oneself or on behalf of another, such as consecrating a child unto the Lord. And I gave you the example of Hannah. Uh, this was a complete volunteer act meant to demonstrate that this person was totally given over to God. We do it today. We don't have baptisms for baby, but we have baby dedications. And in a sense, we are consecrating that baby to the Lord. We're saying, Lord, we're giving you this child and we're setting this child apart for you. That's what we do when we have baby dedications. It's a form of consecration. Now, an, an example of this is um, found in the tribe of Judah and it was under distress though. And you remember the story where um, God had told uh, Jacob, uh, not to um, take any of the booty when he was going down to Ai, and they did. And that family had been, Israel had been consecrated and set apart. That family had been consecrated and set apart. But because they disobeyed, they were destroyed. They were destroyed because of that disobedience. But they were consecrated, in a sense, to the Lord. So to consecrate his son, he was following the procedures of these verses here. And so in verse 2, it says, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When a man consecrates by a vow certain persons to the Lord according to your validation. Now the beauty of these commands is that it gave the one making a vow of consecration something definite to do. Okay, so the vow of consecration was therefore far more than mere words. It had a definite action associated with it. To prevent people from making empty vows. So you were to make this vow unto the Lord, but you were also to validate that vow. And so it wasn't just empty words uh, where, where we kind of have that today with people. Yeah, I promise I'll do that, but then they don't do it at all. And by the way, a vow means uh, keeping your word. When you make a promise or you say you're going to do something, that in a sense is a vow. And then you don't follow through on it. It is not... Uh, keeping that vow. So if your validation is of a male from 20 years old up to 60 years old, then your validation shall be 50 shekels of silver according to the shekels of the sanctuary. So again, the persons were assigned a value according to their age and general useful to society, especially in the agricultural society. There was a definite sense in which a man between 20 and 50 was probably worth more. We have in a sense like that going on when you go to work, right? If you have experience in doing something, chances are that you'll get a job, you'll get a little bit more money, you'll be worth more than the other individual because you just are experienced in it. And usually the older person is the one that's experienced. And so um, that validates us that as you grow in age, you become experienced and you're worth more 
for those in society. And so that's basically what's happening here. Uh, Whoever you set set apart, if they're at a younger age, this is what they're worth. Verse 4, if it is a female, then your validation shall be 30 shekels. And if from five years up, old up to 20 years old, then your validation for a male shall be 20 shekels. And for the female, 10 shekels. And if from a month old up to five years, then your validation for a male shall be five shekels of silver. And for a female, your validation shall be three shekels of silver. And if from 60 years old and above, if it is a male, then your validation shall be 15 shekels. And for a female, 10 shekels. But If he is too poor to pay your validation, then he shall present himself before the priest, and the priest shall set a value for him according to the ability of him who vowed, and the priest shall set that value. Now, most importantly here, no one was prohibited from fulfilling a vow of consecration because they did not have enough money. So that was provided for even if you were poor. If you couldn't afford it, the priest was flexible in saying this is what it would take to cover it. Everyone can give their life to the Lord, right? It doesn't matter whether you're rich or whether you're poor, and God will validate you and sanctify you and set you apart. And so this speaks of God's grace in our lives and how he has given it to us by his um, free will, and it's given to us freely. It doesn't cost us anything at all. So that's a validation of a man, of a man. <clears throat> now we come to the validation of property. And these are things that are consecrated to the Lord. If it is an animal, verse 9, that men may bring as an offering to the Lord, all that anyone gives to the Lord shall be holy. So one condition if it's an animal. It has to have no blemishes, no spots in there at all. And then you can sanctify it unto the Lord. But he shall not substitute it or exchange it good or bad, or good for bad or bad for good. And if he at all exchanges animal for animal, then both it and the one exchanged for it shall be holy. So you can't, you know, uh, decide, okay, I want that one back. (laughs) And so I'm going to give you a bad one. No, you better give a holy one too, just like the first one was verse 11 if it is an unclean animal which they do not offer as a sacrifice to the Lord then he shall present the animal before the priest so if an animal was unclean unfit for sacrifice it could be a vow to the Lord and then redeemed this is the value that it costs to redeem it but if the priest would set that value on the animal and the one and then you would add a fifth as he says here, to the value and give it a total uh, to the tabernacle treasury. So if you wanted to redeem it for whatever reason, then the priest would set that price and then on top of that price was a 20% uh, fee on it to redeem it. And so in a sense, you got to make sure that you are making that vow and you're going to keep that vow without, you know... Uh, trying to get it back and then give something else because it's going to cost you a little bit more. <clears throat> now, why is he he's saying all this? Again, they're going to the promised land. The temple is going to be built. They're going to be making offerings. They're going to be uh, you know, uh, herding in the land, uh, raising grapes, um, fruit trees, and nuts and dates and whatever else. And all these things, they have to give 10% unto the Lord. And as they're giving these things unto God, there are going to be times where they're going to want to take some of it back for whatever reason so they can redeem it, plus add on top of that a 20%. So God is just, again, instructing them how this is done in the temple of God. And I think it's interesting that he ends here because then he ends with tithing at the end because this all ties in together. And for me, it's a way of the church taking care of the ministry in the community, because this is the book of Leviticus, right? This is the works of the priest in the temple and how they ought to, you know, be working in that temple. So it needs to be maintained that it can continue on even after they get into the land of Canaan. So verse 12, he goes on, and the priest shall set a value for it, whether it is good or bad, as you, the priest, value it, so it shall be. 
And if he wants at all to redeem it, then he must add one-fifth to uh, your validation. And the man, and when a man dedicates his house to be holy to the Lord, then the priest shall set a value for it, whether it is good or bad. As the priest values it, it shall stand. So for whatever reason, your house is you know, immaculate, you know, while taken care of, it's, you know, then maybe it's worth a little bit more and so forth. Now, if he who dedicates it wants to redeem his house, then he must add a fifth to the money of your validation to it, and he shall and it shall be his. If a man dedicates to the Lord part of the field of this possession, then your validation shall be according to the seed for it. A homer of barley seed shall be valued at 50 shekels of silver. Now this is interesting. You remember a story in the book of Acts? It was Ananias and Sapphira, and they had vowed to sell the land and give it to the Lord. You remember that? And then they kept some of it back. See, what they should have done was gone to Peter and say, hey, we'd like to buy that back. We'd like to validate that, pay it back, plus 20%. Then they probably would have been okay. But they didn't. They lied and tried to keep it back themselves. And so God is, is setting a system up for the children of Israel here. Right? If he dedicates his field from the year of Jubilee, according to your validation, it shall stand. But if he dedicates his field after Jubilee, then the priest shall reckon to him the money due according to the years that remain to the year of Jubilee. And it shall be deducted from your validation. And if he who dedicates the field ever wishes to redeem it, then he must add one-fifth of money to your validation to it. And it shall belong to him. But if he does not want to redeem the field, or if he has sold the field to another man, it shall not be redeemed anymore. But the field, when it is released in Jubilee, shall be holy to the Lord as a devoted field, and it shall be the possession of the priest. And if a man dedicates to the Lord a field which he has bought, which is not the field of his possession, then the priest shall reckon to him the worth of your validation up to the year of Jubilee, and he shall give your validation on that day as a holy offering to the Lord. And in the year of Jubilee, the field, as we know, we saw this last time, after the 50th year, shall return to him from whom it was brought, and to the one who owned the land as a possession. And all your validation shall be according to the shekels of the sanctuary, 20 graphs of shekels. Now, a shekel was, was the standard uh, very common standard weight of that time that they valued, whether it was in silver or gold or whatever. It was a certain amount of weight that they would uh, give. And it was roughly around 220 English grams. It was later on that a shekel became a little coin, which didn't weigh much. Um, I actually have, I think, a couple of shekels that I bought when I was in Israel. They're all over the place in Israel. You can be digging in the ground and you'll sometimes find a shekel. And there and so they have them in all the stores there. You can purchase a shekel, and they're little tiny, uh, little tiny, like little less than a dime. And the edges aren't completely round. They're like someone took a hammer and they were smashing around the edges. And then there's some symbols on it, and some symbols are different than others, just depending on when they were made. And this is what they would use to redeem the whatever it is, man or house. Verse 26, but the firstborn of the animal, which should be the Lord's firstborn, no man shall dedicate, whether it is an ox or field or sheep. It is the Lord's. So since it's the firstborn, it belongs to God. And you can't buy that back. And if it is an unclean animal, then he shall redeem it according to your validation and shall add a fifth to it. Or if it is not redeemed, then it shall be sold according to the validation. Nevertheless, no devoted offering that a man may devote to the Lord of all that he has, both man and beast, or the field of his possessions shall be sold or redeemed. Every devoted offering is most holy to the Lord. So in certain instances, a person could, place, uh, could be placed under a ban in which case he was to put a, to death, for instance, like I shared the story there with Eli. Um, not Eli, um, Ai, when they went in there and Achan stole some of their goods and buried it in that case there where they 
cannot be redeemed because they did something wrong there. No person under the ban who may become doomed uh, to destruction among men shall be redeemed, but shall surely be put to death. Now, it's interesting because when you gave an animal, and it seems like uh, Ezekiel and Isaiah kind of give us a description of um, how they did this, but when you had sheep, and you had a, a sheep's bin where they would be kept, sheep holding place, they would have a gate, and as the sheep are coming out, they would just count them, and they'd have this rod that was kind of like an orangey color, uh, it might have been a marker of some sort, a die or something, and as they're counting them, going one, two, three, four, and then as soon as they hit 10, they mark it. And the next, and as soon as they hit 10, they mark it. So every 10th was the Lord's. That's how they would consecrate that to the Lord God. So last, and we'll come to the end of this, ties, verse 30 through 32. You see what God's doing here? He's providing the resources to maintain the temple. Unfortunately, we live in a world where resources are needed. Now, we believe, as Calvary Chapel, where the Lord guides, he provides. He will take care. If the Lord is doing the work, if he's the one that had started it, then he's the one that will continue it, and he's the one that will end it. And it's all in the hands of the Lord and no one else's. We have to trust in him. There's been many times in this ministry's life where things have been very bad and I thought for several days that maybe it was done and God was done providing and it would be over. And somehow the Lord just seems to provide. Amen. Something comes through. This year I've been sharing with the board and the board knows this. Um, I haven't shared a whole lot with other people but some ministry leaders, we are struggling just because of what has happened in the past year or so with uh, some people that have put us in this position. Um, but it was a real struggle the first month. And then the second month was a real struggle. Uh, so much so that, that um, it was in the thousands that we were short. And working on the books today, we looked at this month, and now instead of over 4,000, now it's like around 2,000. So we somehow, God has caught us up Amen. Uh, to that point. Not there yet, but it's getting better. Amen. I don't know how he did it, because um, I don't know of, you know of new families at all, maybe a couple that have come uh, this month to the church. And um, other than that, you know, it's just people giving, the Lord laying it on their hearts, but he has, he has provided uh, for us. So he does that. He does that quite often. Mm -hmm. uh, he does that in our personal lives, too. He is faithful to take care of us. So he ends this chapter with uh, the tithes. And so he says very clear in, in, in verse 30, all the tithes of the land. Now he's talking about the land of Canaan. When you go in there and you begin to dwell and live there, and you begin to plant and harvest, then all the land that you have is to be tithed on. So if you have, you know, a hundred pounds of grapes, then what? Ten pounds goes to the Lord. It's just that simple. So whatever you produce, 10% should be given to the priest. What do the priests do with it? Well, it goes to the use of the temple. For the priest to eat. You know, if it's grapes, then the priests get to eat grapes uh, so that they can keep their strength and continue to serve in the temple. So whether it's of the land or whether it's of the seed, even the seed, well, what do the priests need seeds for? Well, maybe they plant themselves to raise some food. Uh, maybe during droughts, uh, when the harvest in the community is not as big and the, it's less than...
history more closely now that I have someone helping me, and we're going to see whether it's even profitable or not. I don't know if it is. And if it isn't profitable, then we need to change some things uh, about it. But this is how they took care of themselves. This is how the temple, because of the drought or the people just not giving, whatever the situation is. So whether the seed of the land or the fruit of the trees. And he makes this very clear in the next statement. It's the Lord's. It is the Lord's. It's all God's. Something we forget. Who created the heavens and the earth? God did. Before Adam and Eve, you know, it says that God had put the plants upon the earth, the animals upon the earth. It's all God's. He's the one that made it, and it belongs to the Lord. Everything belongs to the Lord. Everything that we have belongs to the Lord. And it is holy to the Lord. Now, one commentator said this. He says, although tithing was not made a part of the Ten Commandments, because you don't find it in the Ten Commandments, it had been practiced as a responsibility towards God since the time of Adam, Genesis 14. Adam was the first one to give a tithe unto the Lord before even the law was there. It was something that was practiced. And yet, though it's a tithe, a tenth, it all belongs to the Lord. For the Christians, some would say that everything we have belongs to the Lord. And a Christian should probably be more than 10% because he understands that. A person that doesn't tithe, guys, is a person that doesn't really trust the Lord. They don't really trust the Lord. They don't really think God can provide for them. They think they're the ones providing for themselves. And if they can keep that money, then they're going to be okay. They're not experiencing the grace and the power of God in their life. And you can do everything else right, But that one thing shows that we don't have faith in God, that he can take care of us. I don't know if that makes sense to you or not. If if you're tithing, you're like, yeah, it totally makes sense to me. If you're not tithing, if you're not giving to the Lord, then it makes no sense to you. You're just keeping what's what's his. W.A. Criswell said the fundamental principle of the tithe The practice of dedicating to God a tenth of the increase of the produce of the ground or cattle was the recognition on the part of the people that all their possession actually belonged to the Lord. So they were, in a sense, recognizing the only reason I have produce is because God has blessed the land. The only reason that I can work is because God has given me the health to do so. There are people who can't because they don't have the health. We have the health to work. We have the strength to work because God has given to us. And so it's a recognition and a thankfulness to God because he has helped us to provide for our family. Another commentator, Riley, said, one-tenth of the increase of the land, trees, herbs, uh, herds, uh, flocks had to be given to the Lord as his tithings. Now, part of the tithe could be substituted for with money, right? Because you're giving parts of your trees and your land. So instead of giving, um, let's say, let's let's just say that grapes are 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 not growing that year, and so you have to give ten percent of your grapes. But because no one else is really growing grapes, and there's a demand for grapes, you decide. You know what, Lord? I'm I'm not going to give you grapes. I'm going to give you the money for the grapes, plus I'm going to add 20% on top of that. And so then you get to keep the grapes and the money goes towards the temple and the priests. Then you can go and sell the grapes because they're in demand and probably either make your money back or maybe more (laughs) if you're a shrewd business person. So a God allowed for this to happen. You could redeem your dates, your nuts, you know, whatever it is that you were um, giving to God. Then he says in verse 31, if a man wants at all to redeem any of his tithes, he shall add one-fifth to it, so the 20%. Now, tithes could be also bought back, as I said, added with that 20%. Um, The reference here is to the Jewish mode of tithing sheep, though. Concerning the tithe of the herd or the flock of whatever passes under the rod, 
The tenth one shall be holy to the Lord. So as the sheep passed through that gate, as I said, they would mark the tenth one, and that was the Lord. And remember, you could redeem that one for whatever reason. It was set apart, it was holy, but maybe you wanted that one for whatever reason. Maybe it was a female one. And you wanted to redeem that one. So you could give it another one and then plus the 20% and keep that one for yourself to have even more sheep. But whatever the reason is, that opportunity was there uh, for you to, to do. And then verse 33, to close, he shall not inquire whether it is good or bad, nor shall he exchange it. And if he exchanges it at all, then both it and the one exchange for it shall be holy, it shall not be redeemed. We have to remember that when we give to God, we give the best to God. We can't give him our second best. Why would we give God our second best? We're not supposed to give God our second best. We need to give him our best. He wants our best. That means that you love him more than you love yourself. You're putting him first before yourself. Um, we, he doesn't want our junk. We get a lot of junk. People just, I don't want to go dump, throw it away. I'll give it to the church and they'll do something with it. You know? I mean, we'll take it and we'll try to do something with it. Oftentimes we throw it away. And that's what they should have done. No, God wants you to give your, your best. Um, just something that, that um, I have learned throughout my Christian walk, that when I give to God, I give him my best, whatever it is. If I am going to give him something, I'm not going to give him a, a hand-me-down but I'm going to buy him something that's new and good. And so he concludes, these are the commandments which the Lord commanded Moses for the sons of Israel at Mount Sinai. So they're still there at Mount Sinai. They're surrounding the temporary tabernacle. Moses is at Mount Sinai or in the temple hearing instructions from the Lord and then he's writing these things down and he's telling the children of Israel uh, about all these things that they are going to encounter while they're in the, in the promised land. And these are all, by the way, commandments. <clears throat> so you can look at <clears throat> what Exodus 32, the Ten Commandments. Those are Ten Commandments that Moses brought down from the mountain. And yet these are commandments that the Lord has given to Moses while he's off the mountain. You know, on top of the other commandments on regulations and rules and dealing with each other and land and as we've been going through all of this. They are God's people and they are to be ruled by God. Notice that it says for the sons of Israel. The word Israel means ruled by God. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. If you remember, he was wrestling with God. Yeah. And God says, your name now will be Israel. Jacob meant deceiver or supplanter. And Jacob was a deceiver and a supplanter. He lived in the flesh. He was a fleshly man. He was always conniving and trying to figure out how to do things. Like that person that doesn't tithe. You know, he's always trying to figure out how not to, you know, support or how not to, how to get out of something, you know. He's a conniver. And so God touched his hip. And crippled him and said, now you're going to be ruled by God. That's what Israel means. And so these are commandments to the children, to the children of Jacob, Israel, who are to be ruled by God. Now, go 2,000 years later or so, and you come to the New Testament. And in the New Testament, you have the epistles, which are what? Instructions, right? They're instructional books that God has given to us. And these are books that we are to be obedient to. They are, in a sense, our commandments, but not in a sense of laws, but in our relationship with God, how we ought to approach God, how we ought to live before God. So they're not necessarily, they are commandments, but they are commandments that are done from love. And John, 1 John speaks a lot about that, right? If you love me, what? Follow my commandments. Yes. And so he's talking about his instructions from from what, uh, Corinthians, Romans, Corinthians, all the way to Jude. There's a lot of instructions in those books. And of course, you have it in the Gospels also, as Jesus gives us instructions. <clears throat> These are instructions that we should 
follow after because we are Christians. These are, these are the instructions and commandments for the children who are called Christians. Now, what does the word Christian mean? Christ-like. So here's Jacob called Israel. Here we are, whatever our name is, and now we're called Christians, Christ-like. We're to walk like Christ. You remember Jesus in one of his prayers, and he said, Father, I've done everything you've asked me to do. That's how Christ walked. That's how we should walk, that we would do everything that the Father would ask us to do. Do we? No, we don't. We fail because our flesh is with us. And he's provided for us in the instructions, right? And when that happens, you offer up a sheep. No, you confess. You confess the Lord, he's faithful and just to forgive you. So you see the similarities in the Old Testament and the New Testament are still there. The principles that God has set aside for us and how we ought to live uh, before him are right there in the book of Leviticus as we live in the promised land. Uh, You know we're not in the promised land, right? I mean, we're kind of like in the promised land the land of Canaan in a sense. In the Old Testament, when the children of Israel were going to Canaan, many commentators say that is a type of, that is a type of living in the world. It's not heaven. It's not perfection. It is a battle constantly because once they got into the promised land, they were constantly battling, right, the different nations and kick them out. They were struggling, and in fact, there was a point where they just stopped fighting, and they started dwelling with them, and then they started acting like them. They got into trouble, so the land of Canaan was not like the promised land that would be the perfect walk. No, it was the picture of the Christian walking in the world. It's a picture of the world, and so here we are as Christians. We're walking now in the world. In a sense, this is our Canaan, and we're walking in this world. And we need to walk like Christ in this world. We can't let the culture come into our homes, into our church. We must set the standards that God wants us to live by according to his word. So just like the children of Israel that went into the land of Canaan, so we live in, the, in the, this world and we need to set those standards. And there's constant battle, right? We're constantly battling against the world with our flesh, with the culture, the various things. And so we need to remember that we are Christians. We're Christ-like, and God is good. Amen? Amen. So that finishes Leviticus. Um, I'm going to take probably a a week or so break. Next week, Jesse is leading us for worship, a night of worship on Wednesday. And then uh, Randy's going to teach after that on a Wednesday night, uh, maybe two nights. And then I'm going to start the book of Numbers, which... I believe we will go through rather quickly because there's a lot of uh, repetitive stuff. Yeah, so we'll probably get through it re- rather quickly. So let's, let's pray. Thank you, guys. Gracious Father, I, I just pray, Lord, that your spirit has taught us something, Lord, tonight. Uh, Lord, that um, even if it's just one thing, Lord, thank you for your grace, Lord. Forgive me, Father. <sighs> Lord, we just uh, just lift up all these things to you, Lord. Yes, Lord. Uh, we lift up our hearts to you, Father. Mm-hmm. We have we have challenges, Lord, that we face every single day, Lord, and we need forgiveness, Father. Definitely, Lord. Would you help us? Would you guide us and lead us, Lord? And Lord, as your word says, never leave us or forsake us, Father. Mm-hmm. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you guys. Thank you for coming out on this rainy day. It got pretty scary there for a little bit, didn't it? The lightning was like a couple miles away. I was sitting in my room, and I could, I could see it like right out the